it is my joy to speak with you, my dear young ones, my dear brothers and sisters in the faith. It is my joy to share with you the joys of these days, how you have sought the Lord to be holy, to please him, and to be examples and to be models and ideals for your fellow brothers and sisters, young ones like you, especially young ones in the faith. So as you leave after your retreat this year, which has been a very unique retreat indeed, you would be asking yourselves, where do we go from here? What do we do after this? The disciples, when they were, when they were being sent by, the, by Christ himself, two by two, they weren't sure what to expect. But when they came back, they were joyful. They were joyful that the devil had listened to them and that they could drive away the evil one. But Christ told them, no, that shouldn't be the source of your joy. That one is taken care of. You should be joyful that your names are written in heaven. So my dear young ones, be joyful that your names are written in heaven. You know, if God tells you, your name is written in heaven, you know what that means? And no one will cancel it. No one will block it out. And even if you want to go and block it out, your, your guardian angel will tell you, no, 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 please don't do that. So that is what I'm sharing with you as you leave after your retreat. I've decided to put these as challenges to our faith yesterday and today. Challenges to our faith. And there are 20 points I'm going to share with you in seven pages, very briefly. Challenges to our faith. The challenges of yesterday and the challenges of today. The first one. Among the first of the intense challenges which every baptized person encounters in sharing the love of God is the capacity of making an authentic and integral communication of the faith. The undiluted, undiminished handing over of the faith. As you come out from, from your retreat, holy, with halos on your heads, eager to do wonderful things, beautiful things for God, the devil will just be looking around and say, let's see. So the question will be, are you ready to communicate the faith authentically and integrally and to everyone? Every Christian is daily challenged to faithfully accomplish the mission to which we are called. And in order to be obje objective in the trans transmission of the faith, the reasoning will be based on solid theological principles. You would tell me solid, theological, but we didn't do theology. Of course, every Christian is a theologian. And not only solid theological principles, but these should be developed within a vision of the Catholic faith in its integrity, integrity and interconnectedness. It has to be integral. And also there should be some connection between what we said, what we are saying, and what we are knowing that half-truths or distorted messages do not lead to solid faith at all. And this is a sentiment we cherish in the joy we have of sharing the faith. Second point, apart from the integral transmission of the faith, there is also the question of the manner of presenting Christ to others. And also, of course, how others perceive our faith. Because one thing is the way we see our faith the way we love it, and we're joyful about it. But how do others see us and our faith? That is important. Through our confirmation, we are supposed to have strong convictions and the fortitude not to falter in giving testimony. We are faced with a challenge of boldly proclaiming Christ, not just him as any other being, but as the son of God and as the unique savior. Evidently, if Jews are listening to us, they will be the first to react saying that we are transforming their brother Jew into a God. You see, things change immediately. 
Then you say, no, 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 it's not that, but he is God. Then you say, he is just uh, my brother, and you are making him a God. The Muslims could say that he is simply one of the great prophets, just one of them. In societies where Christians are in the minority, some would label us as intransigent exclusivists or as arrogant extremists, or simply as conservatives, or at best, fundamentalists. In fact, in the face of increasing relativism, pluralism, and secularism in the contemporary world, the most fundamental and prevalent misapprehension and misunderstanding of the Catholic faith that we face, especially in the society around us, is the misrepresented notion that it is arrogant to claim Jesus Christ as a unique mediator of salvation. Some Catholics, in an effort to be politically correct and not to hurt the sensitivity of other faiths, are hesitant to affirm that Jesus is the unique savior and that every other one takes from him. And with that goes another tendency to say that all faiths and religions are equal and the same and that in whatever way we worship God, we are correct. We have the duty to clarify that our faith in Christ and in Christ himself and in his uniqueness, this faith doesn't entail the devaluation of the world's religions or any other person's religion. The religions of the world are moments in the human search for God. They therefore deserve respect and study. There is no doubt about it. And we bear in mind the immense cultural richness in their witness to the desire for God, which is evident in every human heart. Every human person thirsts for God. However, however, our faith is different and we have to affirm it. We understand God differently and we hold on to our own faith without attacking any other one. Third point. In the absence of the joy to share the faith, as we just saw in the first challenge, and also where there is lack of zeal in the expression of the faith, invariably, there could be what some call some form of dis disenchantment or feeling of disappointment of someone who has always believed. I explain. Someone who has always been with us, sharing the same faith, receiving the same sacraments, can become disenchanted. The joy will just evaporate. The peace will go, and the person will feel disappointed. And the person may have very serious reasons and valid reasons also for feeling some sort of disenchantment. So the question is, why are people disenchanted? Even the Pharisees felt disappointed with Christ. At the initial attraction, and their positive impressions, the fruitless effort to make him king, they became dis disappointed, among other reasons, because he did not dance to their tune. He saw their approach to salvation much differently from theirs. Some of the people wanted freedom through civil obedience, disobedience, but Christ didn't follow them. Christ pulled away from their political intent. Some wanted to be hard on the Romans. He didn't join them. So the temptation towards disenchantment is a serious one. And there are many reasons, even valid ones, and cannot just be dismissed as insignificant. It shows a negative situation that has not been adequately handled. It means a willful and sometimes aggressive or sentimental aversion from an ideal. If someone with passion and zeal holds onto an ideal and then decides to look to back out, it is serious. Often the reason cited by those who leave their ideas in the church is that they are disenchanted with the Christian faith, disappointed with the ill -treat treatment they received or the inability to handle the scandalous situations around them. Disenchantment could occur due to wrong information also, which becomes too late to rectify. It could be due to high expectations in the unfolding of the idea. If we, re if we remember in our philosophy, there was a man called Bertrand Russell during the last century, one of the contemporary existentialist philosophers. 
who wrote to explain why he gave up the Christian faith. And his book, Why I'm Not a Christian, is well known. He was a thinker. So you, just, you can't just push him aside as a fool. He knew what he was saying. He was full of profound thought about God, what God should be, and how he should behave and con conduct the affairs of the world. His ideas of God did not fit into the reality of Christians, and so he gave up with Christians and their God. People like him do not understand why we talk of a good God, where there is, no, where there is so much, why there, are, there is so much evil in the world which he created. He could not accept the idea of an all-powerful God who would not prevent, prevent the pain and the inconvenience of children who come into the world with some handicap. He failed to conceive the image of an all-knowing God who does not seem to know about all the evil in the world and their wicked intrigues. So, for people like Bertrand Russell, either God is incapable or an all-knowing, but he's insensitive, or for him, God is caring and knows, but he's incapable, or that he is capable and sensitive to human suffering, but he has no idea of what is happening. So that is for him. Individuals continue to get, in, to get disenchanted for the wrong reasons or even for reasonable motives. Whatever decision we take in life, even when others move us to get disenchanted, we have the responsibility for our own faith. Whatever or whoever may have caused our disenchantment, our decision to follow the disenchantment is our own, and we take the responsibility. There was the case of a priest who, after his studies overseas, wanted to leave the priesthood. He was disenchanted with the church and with everyone. And all this was related to the sad treatment he received in, in the university during his studies. After listening to his objective narration, I say objective narration because it was his own experience and it was a true experience and a painful one. I sympathized with him and tried to take sides with him, but no further. I would not sacrifice my call to the priesthood because of ill treatment. If not, what about the radical heroic attitude to pain and suffering and trials? Someone has to be heroic. Someone has to adopt an attitude of radicality in the face of pain. Number four, nonconformism. Almost related to disenchantment is nonconformism. They're not the same, but they are simply related. Nonconformists easily become disenchanted. For them, external reality, the institution, the establishment, all that do not correspond to their manner of thinking and their choice. By nature, they must show some sort of, some sort of rebellion against the order, another order. It doesn't mean they are bad persons, no, but it's just that they are rebellious characters and they have to rebel. They have to show the other side. It simply means they are part of the force of opposition. Sometimes nonconformism leads us to disenchantment or the other way. Number five, the God we expect to meet. How is the God, what is our idea of, of the God we want to meet? Is it our own idea, our own formulation, or does it correspond to the external and objective reality that is God himself? Once a priest, when he was preaching in a church, I was there. He called my now departed aunt, he called her a woman of faith, and she was really. She didn't lose confidence in God when she met serious trials. She had lost two sons and her dad, and a friend in one of, in one, and one of this, and also a friend of one of the sons in a ghastly mo motor accident. And her husband also lost the new car he had just bought. It was a chain of losses, but the, but the couple herself 
and my uncle maintained their calm. They were a people of faith. However, this is not always the case. Some people leave the church after a serious and unexpected tragedy, after a painful event, after some major loss in their business. It could be after many, prayer, many years of prayer and expectation of a positive answer from God and no answer is forthcoming. A couple may decide to leave the church in search elsewhere of a child. Or they will say, well, the church doesn't allow in vitro experimentation and they decide to leave the church just because they want to do what they want. Despair, de depression, unanswered prayers, especially in the experience of suffering and pain, leads some to reject their religious upbringing and commitment. The God we expect, uh, our image of the God whom we want to project. So loss of faith may result from a clear misunderstanding of the ways of God. It happens when we want God to fit into our own plans, our own ways, our own structures, our own institutions. And we become disappointed when such is not the case, when God doesn't stoop down to our own ways and forms. To follow God and follow him faithfully, we must fit into his own ways and not the other way. Otherwise, it will not work. Sixth point, authenticity and continuity in living the Christian way of life. For the average baptized person, it is not enough to be called a Christian and to be a church goer. There is much more. Answering the call to a deeper life of Christ, a life of conversion, a yearning to live a saintly life, without compromising anything, that is a Christian life. Living this daily in spite of everything. This brings me to the point which, or to the expression recidivists. Recidivists are those who, they embrace the Christian faith. And what happens at a stage, they reject it and bolt away the quitters. We have to know that recidivists are not lacking even in the journey of faith. Some easily fall away. Before we fall away, let us think, think twice and examine and see, why do I decide to leave? My path towards holiness, I've decided now to be a holy person and to make every effort to allow God to sanctify me. Can I maintain the dynamism of my movement? Yes, with the help of God. Seven, coherence and constancy in our baptismal commission. So following from what I just said, we are called to coherence between what we learn to believe in on the one hand and the practice of faith in our a practice of faith in our daily lives, in our places of work. It is expected that faith would blend with everyday values to the point of creating some harmony between religiosity, devotion, the profession of faith on the one hand, and real growth on the other. The ethical and moral values are meant to be suffused into our daily lives. Among these are the ethical principles of love, sacrifice, giving priority to others, justice, honesty, transparency, sincerity, uprightness, conviction, truthful, truthfulness, courage. These are expected to permeate our professional, social, and family life. Eight ignorance of basic Catholic principles of the faith. Ignorance could be a challenge to my faith, my limited knowledge, or my inability to search for more knowledge regarding my faith. And also, of course, the inability to articulate them to others. Everyone knows that personal conviction is one of the tools to, to spreading the faith. 
hardly would anyone show interest in a faith about which its exponents seem too incompetent, too timid, too shy, and embarrassed to communicate frankly and honestly. Undoubtedly, from experience, the fullness of the faith of the truth and the beauty of the message about Christ is immensely attractive when it is communicated without excuses and defenses. When it excludes arrogance and unnecessary insistence, and of course, especially, when it is done with skill and eloquence, with joy, serenity, and sincerity. That's the joy of the gospel. If what we transmit, if what we want to share with others is great and joyful, if we are convinced about it, we shouldn't be arrogant about it. We shouldn't insist unnecessarily. We shouldn't communicate it with excuses and defenses. It should be manifesting us through serenity and sincerity. Number nine, the capability of forming a close-knit Christian community or association. When the Christian church began about 2000 years ago, people appreciated the fact that they were closely knit together. A common goal brought them all together and they formed a community. Today, Christian associations that are formed along the lines of the early Christian community also develop those same, those same characteristics. Therefore, a close-knit community has, among others, the advantage of creating a holy, mature, knowledgeable, and responsible group of persons. In these groups, there is trust, there is unity, there is cooperation, there is love, there is the consolidation of Christian faith, there is the openness to give, a, to give support. There is a sense of sisterhood and brotherhood. There is perseverance. There is courage in the faith. And especially there is moral support. Each person knows where his or her brother or sister is. However, care has to be taken not to allow it to drift into exclusivism as happens in some religious movements and close-knit associations, which is true. Like everything human, we have to be very careful that it doesn't become exclusivist, that it is just ourselves and then every person is put away. Unfortunately, it happens. We know from experience. Number 10, geographic mobility, intercultural exchange, globalization, and many other factors diminish faith commitment and the sense of community. If someone belongs to a community that is in Belfast and the person is living in Dublin and the community meets twice a week, how can the person travel to Belfast every twice a week? It's not easy. So mobility, geographical distances, all these diminish the capacity of creating a sense of community. The urban factor, those who live in the anonymity, anonymity of the urban center. In the village, people know themselves. People are very, there is more cohesion. The person lands in the urban, urban center in Dublin and there is complete anonymity. And the sense of protection gradually eases up. The university set setting also can become a hindrance towards growth in the faith, unfortunately, because there are interested groups that try to make their presence felt, especially those who may be against our faith. And they let us know that since we don't form part of their own group, that they will show us, which is true. These are experiences which we have in the university. Youthful exu exuberance, those who want to show their youth, their beauty, their handsomeness. They just want to say, just let me, let, just leave me a little bit. I want to show my youthful exuberance. 
afterwards we shall see, which is true. Teenagers, the example of teenagers, you know, and the novelty about technology, groups, peer pressure, all these are factors that could easily make us lose our faith or suspend our faith and drift off into other forms of spiritual expression. There could also be some sort of, um, I would say, cultural uh, curiosity or spiritual curiosity. Like someone who was asking me, can I go to a new age? What they are saying there looks so attractive. And it's not, they're not talking about religion and so on. I, I told the person, look before you leak. All that glitters are not good. You know, the person came back three months later and said, you are correct. I said, well, that is the reality. It makes for a mature mind to know how to pick and choose, and choose maturely and responsibly. Number 11, the challenge of giving personal and individual attention to everyone, especially those who are socially challenged and those who fall off the path. When we did social, social psychology, one of the factors you know, in um, the religious factor was a major point which we discussed. And this is, why is it that people easily drift away and drift into groups where they are acceptable? Just because they are human beings. The answer is so is simple. We are human beings. Human beings tend to drift into places where they are socially acceptable and where they fit in. It takes courage for someone to go into a group where the person knows the person is not easily acceptable, but where the person can make a difference. It, make, it takes a lot of courage. And that is why for the youth, this is a very major challenge. Every soul is priceless. Every living person is the glory of God. And that is why your friend, your neighbor, your fellow Christian, Catholic, close to you, is priceless. Give him or her your attention, if you can. People lose attention when they come to the universities. They feel lonely. No one attends to them. All of a sudden, some, yeah, some unwitting group, if I put it that way, I would like to be very gentle on them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to, be, to hurt any group. But the person could just easily fall, in, fall prey to those who see her loneliness or his loneliness, and they take advantage of it. And that is why, therefore, every individual around us needs attention. With this consciousness, the teacher of the faith, I would say the committed believer is aware of the challenge to give attention to everyone according to his or her individuality, personal needs, personal challenges, role, duty, rights, and especially needs. Number 12, this is a delicate one, and it refers not to you, but to, to, to us. Sometimes we, the members of the clergy, those who are consecrated to the work of God, I repeat, sometimes we, members of the clergy, could also be a challenge to ourselves and to our ministry, knowingly or knowingly. I know you must, you'll be giggling and smiling and say, yeah, Father, hit at them. No, he, yeah, well, what to do? I put it this way. This could be challenges of exclusivism. I've mentioned exclusivism before in this. Authoritarianism, the use of authority or excess use of authority. Clericalism, that is seeing oneself being, being a priest as a, sense, as a center of attention and also authority. It's the same all over the world. We are all human beings. It's not just where we are, we have also to bear in mind that there are so many good priests. Therefore, if we see one who is authoritarian or exclus exclusivist or clericalist, look, turn and you will see many others, your chaplains, for example, 
who are great, very great, selfless, who give up their best for our own good. That is why we shouldn't emphasize the negative. However, this point is important. Why do I mention it? It means that all over the world, human beings are the same. The human person wants to be the attention of activity, which is true. And the best place to be the attention, to receive attention in our activity is within the church. It's true. Just go up to, close to the altar and from there you look down. When people are full in the church, just stand there and look down and you tell them, the Lord be with you. And they'll reply, and with your spirit. Now, if there are a thousand persons there, a thousand persons are telling you, and with your spirit, you said you're just one voice. There are a thousand voices wishing it to you. Is it not that? Is that not great? You see where it begins, you know? You, any sign you make there, there is, a, a, there is a reply to your sign. There is a response. And therefore, like one boy said one day, well, this is a very good platform for political campaign. I said, take it easy. That is why priests cannot and should not enter into politics. It's in canon law. Why? Because they're on a, they find themselves on a platform where the temptation is very strong to use it for campaign. And that is it. So I come back to my point because this is a very important point. In the church, our, the associations in which we find ourselves, the groups in which we find ourselves are easily very wonderful platforms for communication, for influence on those who form part of it. And not only that, those who form part of it have already a psychological, positive psychological attitude towards whoever stands to listen. Like now, you are all listening to me. There is a positive attitude towards whatever I will say. Otherwise, you will all rise up and against what I'm, whatever I'm saying. It doesn't happen because we are human beings. The spiritual psychology be behind whatever we are doing has already tuned us towards being docile. And that is why the docility of the Christian shouldn't be abused. That's the point I'm getting to. Our docility should not be abused by anyone, negatively or positively. And that is why lay initiatives sometimes die off in the church because somebody who has a position of authority finds the lay involvement as a threat to his or his or her insecurity on the person's survival as the false center of every apostolate. Just because the person says, no, this apostolate didn't refer to me. You didn't tell me what, that you're about to establish you 2000 in my parish. Therefore, it will not exist. Excuse me. The person is not God. There is no limit. Canon law gives us. There is no limit to lay involvement. It's just a question of coordination, cooperation, working together. I've touched very delicate points, but I have to touch them because it is part of the reform that the Holy Father wants now. We have to tune down and make room for everybody. If the church in our land has to survive, the lay people will find their place and they should be given their place within the church. And they shouldn't do it outside. They have to do it from within through cooperation, of course, docility, dialogue, communication, giving every, each person giving up his or her best. And therefore, we, in our responsibilities, should always make room for other initiatives that are pleasing to God. And we shouldn't be an obstacle to the growth of the kingdom of God. Number 13, the need for more intensive theological formation for the laity. Sometimes in the church, you know, the objection is, ah, they are the laity, they haven't done theology, excuse me. 
our theology begins with baptism. When the priest was asking, was asking our, our parents, what do you appreciate of the goodness of God? How do you appreciate the goodness of God? Oh, we appreciate it by bringing our child for baptism. What is profound theological expression? Whoever says it is already, already a theologian. Who would then say that my parents weren't theologians because they didn't stand, study under Karana? Well, so theological formation, but it is also true that it's not just enough to affirm in the church, you know, our baptis baptismal commitments. It is also necessary to go for a, a formal theological formation because this intensifies our commitment. And this can be done through what we call autodidactics. I don't need to go to university to study theology in order to know it. There are many theological books available, studying on my own. My father was a great homilectic and he was the one who wrote my first sermon but he never went to any school of homiletics. He did it. He studied it on his own. Just an example. Therefore, the laypersons are at the grassroots level of, Christian, of the Christian community. They constitute the essential elements of founding basic Christian communities. They're in touch with human reality to which they give a particularly exalted humane approach. They easily win the confidence of the locals and often they're easily available for catechetics and pastoral work. They have to be given a chance to learn theology and to learn it well. I go to another point that is also very important. The challenge of living with a fading spiritual legacy a fading spiritual legacy. In many countries, there is a spiritual legacy that has lasted for more than a thousand years. In Ireland, the spiritual legacy has lasted for about 1,700 years. And therefore, the active role and the dynamism of, of lay persons in the church, excuse me, and therefore when a legacy fades away, another surges up. We shouldn't be afraid. If the legacy in Ireland, if some part of it is fading, it just means there is call for renewal. There is another one just cropping up. There is such a constancy in life that a receding legacy doesn't create a nightmare, no. There is a new light appearing in the horizon and we have to discover it. If we dwell too much on the receding legacy, we lose sight of the novelty, which is completely different from the preceding one, although they are related. Personally, I discourage people from making and keeping too many of cultural values. I say too many. I don't mean that they are not good, but hanging on to them and not giving room for novelty. The old should lead us to the new. We have to be aware of our communion, of communion with saints and the communion of saints. If we are part of our spiritual legacy, then the legacy is not fading away. It is undergoing transformation. New forms are coming up. We could so hang nostalgically onto our fading past that we miss the present and future legacies. We have to know what God is telling the people of Ireland. You have a lot over the years which you have shared with humanity, with many countries. Many new cultures have come out because of what you give to them. And they have come up with something new because of what you give to them. And therefore, you also, what you had would help you to create something new. It's only the courage to accept change. The challenge to intellectual charity. This is an, a, unique type, a unique point. 
Pope Benedict once urged his listeners, who were, who were theologians, to exercise intellectual charity. The necessity of taking people seriously when they come forward with spiritual questions that seem far-fetched or uncommon, that may seem offensive and oppositional, that may seem even stupid and unreal. For the Holy Father, Pope Benedict, these questions, different from the normal daily curiosities, should not be brushed aside as irrelevant or the absence of faith. Why? Because profession professionals and intellectuals could get stuck in their efforts to understand the faith at a different level and could come up with queries that are quite unusual and seem strange. It could also be a stroke of pride and arrogance, which may need some taming, which is true, we're human beings. So faith in God is not always easy to explain and to understand, neither for little children, nor for intelligent intellectuals and professionals. There are situations where the difficulty could lie in the manner of articulation or due to ignorance on the part of the teacher or the incorrect use of expressions or some scandal in the behavior of the tutor or the manner of celebration of a liturgical event. It could come in different ways. The fact is that there is some difficulty in comprehension and someone has to bridge that gap. In such circumstances, it could be a true challenge to know how to engage the queries of people who are different. They are simply different and we cannot change them. What we can change is the way we communicate the faith to them. How to enter into their own realm, how to reassure them, how to win their confidence and then argue with them attentively. In fact, Heidegger called it phenomenalism. Seeing the truth by entering into the realm of the other person and from there drawing the person onto the objectivity of truth. Wonderful. Number 16. There are situations where Christian intellectuals attain high positions in their professions. In these circumstances, evangelical testimony would become a challenge. You see, this point is similar to the previous one, to number 15. And this could apply where Christian affirmation gives the impression of not being politically correct. So how do we help these persons who want to be politically correct but without losing a face in public? The courage of witnesses, of witnessing, is therefore not taken for granted. In fact, among the greatest challenges for the laity and especially Catholic professionals is their fear of witnessing in public. They show hesitation in standing up to what they believe in, not because they are not bold or resistant, no, but they may not be willing to show offense. This situation suffocates their identity as professionals. A TD, a Catholic, who wants to show his faith, who is challenged in public, what does he do? So the church needs to show that intellectuals have a place in Christianity. And above all, that these intellectuals have to use their talents in communicating the faith. They have to bear in mind that the intellectual apostolate is integral to the mission of the church. Number 17, we are gradually getting to the end. The world is changing rapidly. And so the church must also adapt to the social, cultural, political, and technological methods used for the transmission of the faith. Even the Holy Father is now at Twitter has a tweet and tweets. So, of urgent importance is a large-scale re-evaluation, reappraisal, reform and renewal of the catechetical and educational apostolate of the church. This is taking place already. Some aspects of the old forms have played their roles and have done so very well, but they are falling into disuse. So new forms are being tried, including Zoom, as we're now doing. Social challenges. There are also some concrete daily pastoral challenges in the family, we are number 18. The divorce, for example. A young couple may decide to divorce just because they have noticed that their characters do not match as they were doing, as they had before their marriage. Young Catholic marriages are not stable due to lack of formation. 
lack of sacrifice, lack of maturity, lack of pastoral guidance, lack of mutual trust, lack of support. What to do? The preparation of young ones for marriage through family spirituality is very important today. Over the years since Vatican II, much has been done in many countries to create marriage formation centers at the diocesan or parish levels where couples are given adequate causes which lead up to their marriage. It is good to continue to give fund, um, uh, spiritual attention to this fundamental aspect. Number 19, the call to interreligious dialogue. I know some will be surprised that I, am, I haven't mentioned this before now. Interreligious dialogue, other faiths. When we live here today, some of those whom we shall meet on the way are those of other faiths. What do we do? In itself, interreligious dialogue is already challenging. It's already challenging to call the attention of someone who adheres to a different expression of the Christian faith. Therefore, to dialogue with a non-believer in Christ is already heroic, especially where it pertains to exposing the basic tenets of our belief to someone who doesn't see with us. More difficult still, when these others arrive with aggression and sentiments of terror and intimidation, what do we do? In many countries, Christians are targets of attacks. Christians would normally tend to avoid aggressive or violent situations because they want to remain nonviolent like Christ. On the other hand, there, this is the real challenge of our Christian faith to manifest to the unbeliever the reasons for what we believe. Their presence in our midst could be an opportunity for encounter, and this demands courage, creativity, patience, coherence, and love. The manner and the intensity of migration today creates tension, nervousness, suspicion, fear, intolerance, rejection. And therefore the task of the Christian is to discover adequate evangelical means for this delicate encounter and to present the Christian message through interactive witness. Last point, too much legalism and little love among Christians, some Christians. Some people feel that one of the greatest challenges for, in the Christian life is that we don't practice what we preach. I tell those people, we are talking to human beings, not angels. Human beings continue making an effort. There is a good will. And that is my own experience over the years that there are very many Christians who are making serious efforts in spite of our criticism. If we make the efforts ourselves and the other person make their own efforts, that is already something. But if we just stand by and continue criticizing and criticizing, who will bear the cut? Our gospel is the gospel of love and joy. Our God is not a God of legalism. However, the spirit of the law is also a joyful one because St. Paul tells us that we need the law in order just to tune ourselves into order. So my dear ones, these are the points I've tried to share with you. There are 20 points. There could be more. You can co complete them as, as you wish. But the major thing is not so much the multiplication of points and challenges as the love and the joy with which we carry out our Christian faith. Every day, making an effort could be difficult and I would like to end with this point. We never know how much effort the other person close to us is making. We do not know how many graces the other person has received. God is the only judge. If we judge others too harshly, we may be making a mistake. And that is why we continue to share the joy of being Christians, encouraging the other person, 
especially those who have come into the world with a minus, those who have to make serious efforts, even just to make the first, to take the first step. God knows about it. And with that, I wish you the best. May the Almighty God bless you and keep you in his name. May he sanctify your intentions and your resolutions. May he accompany you on the way. May he send your guardian angels to guide you. And may your resolve, our resolve to be holy, may he sanctify this resolve to the glory of his name for our salvation. And may he bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. Go in peace. Thank you.